So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marianne Farkas, and I am the Director of Training, Dissemination, and TA at the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation. More relevant to this particular afternoon, I, along with Dr. Marsha Ellison at the University of Massachusetts, am the co-PI of the of sector, which is the Center on Knowledge Translation for Employment Research. And we are providing this presentation today okay. under the auspices right. of the Thank you very key. much. Could Bye. somebody please mute yourself? Thank you. Bye-bye. Jean, could you mute yourself, please? Thank you. So under the auspices of the KT Academy at Sector, and um, I'd like to introduce... All right. I should, Amanda, can you mute everyone? Because I cannot, please. Thank you. Our topic for today is turning research findings into implementation activities, the knowledge to action cycle. And, you know, we've all done something with the findings of our research, and it may be journal articles and presentations or a full blown effort to get the findings incorporated into daily practice in the employment projects that we've done as part of our knowledge or Nidler grants rather. So this afternoon is focused on the knowledge to action cycle, which breaks down the implementation process into actionable phases, starting with determining the knowledge practice gap through sustaining the change. And our one hour together is going to be in the form of a conversation with a series of questions and answers about the knowledge uh, to action cycle and how to use this framework to ensure that research findings guide change in practice. Um, and I'd like to start by introducing you to Dr. Ian Graham, who developed this particular framework. Dr. Graham is a distinguished professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health and School of Nursing at the University of Ottawa in Canada and a senior scientist at the Center for Practice Changing Research at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. His areas of research are health services and knowledge translation or implementation science. Dr. Graham studies factors influencing the use of research and evidence and decision-making and ways to promote its use. He's been inducted as a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, the New York Academy of Medicine and the Royal Society of Canada. And we are very honored today to have him with us. Um, I want to say, Dr. Graham, can you say hello just so people know where you are? Hi, good, on the screen. good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> good afternoon. I just want to acknowledge Nidler as always for funding uh, the KT Academy under the grant uh, and to say that the Center on Knowledge Translation for Employment Research is organized to promote the use of employment research findings and research-based products. And as a side note, we intend to offer coaching to Nidler grantees in 2023 on using this particular framework for your dissemination training or technical assistance grant activities. So please stay tuned for notifications later this year about uh, these free coaching opportunities. So let's, let's begin our conversation with three or four questions that we've prepared. And at the end of the discussion, we'll then add a question that came from you folks, from the people who registered for the meeting this afternoon. So, I'd like to start then with question number one. And question number one is to you, Ian, uh, obviously. 
to ask you to describe in a few sentences how the Knowledge to Action Framework came about and how it's used now. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, share some thoughts on the Knowledge to Action Cycle. So the Knowledge to Action uh, Cycle is a planned action model uh, by definition. And and it, it's in the class of what's sometimes referred to as process models or frameworks. And it because, as you've already mentioned, it breaks down change, the change process into manageable components. Um, and so the, the purpose of all planned action models are to influence the decisions and behaviors of a group. Um, and my interest and probably yours is the uptake of uh, research findings for the most part or evidence which may come in different forms. And so where the um, KTA came from was in about 2003 and 2004, I was working uh, with a colleague, Dr. Jo Logan at the Ottawa Hospital and she was the Director of Professional Development. And so she was interested on how to influence healthcare providers to um, adopt uh, up-to-date practice guidelines. Um, and I had finished my PhD and I was interested generally in uh, what are the factors that influence change in healthcare um, and health practice by um, clinicians. And so we applied to the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which would be the NIH equivalent, to do a synthesis and a theory or a concept analysis of planned action models and frameworks that were out there and we knew of a handful, maybe six or seven, the um, Titler's Iowa model, Stetler's model. We had published the Ottawa model of research use. So we knew there were a few out there and we thought that would be an easy grant to do because there wouldn't be many and we would identify them and then we would compare them and identify what the key components of planned action models were. Anyway, we were very fortunate. We got the grant and we started searching and it wasn't just in healthcare, it was in management, uh, social work. Um, I think we found one that was, that was developed for firefighters, um, educators. Anyway, we, we um, amassed 31 of them. And of course it was challenging to find them because they're not labeled as planned action models. But anyway, we found 31 and then we made the decision that we probably had saturation and that the extra time trying to find more of them wasn't probably worth it. And so we stopped looking and said, okay, let's now do the analysis on the 31. And so essentially the knowledge to action cycle is the meta planned action framework because it takes into account the 31. But actually I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. Um, the analysis is only based on 30 because one of them we couldn't make any sense of at all. And the, the process was we used uh, Avant and Walker's um, theory analysis process so that we were consistent in what we were looking at. And then we kind of created a summary of what we thought the framework was about or the model was about. And then we sent it back if the originators were still alive and we could find them, we sent them back. And we tried that and we still weren't able to make a whole lot of sense of the 31st one. So uh, what I'm talking to you today is really based on 30, not the 31. And uh, just to give you a sense, one of the things that we looked for was uh, the intended audiences of these 31 planned action models. And in 29 cases, it was practitioners, not necessarily clinicians, because we included social workers, for example, and teachers um, as practitioners. 25 of the, the models said that they could be used by managers, 15 by health uh, policymakers, 12, only 12 of them said that it was intended to be used or could be used by researchers. Seven of them could be used by patients um, and only three of them um, were intended to be used by the public. So that's a little bit of the the background. And uh, in terms of uh, the question, you know, how are the, how is the knowledge to action framework uh, or model um, used? Mainly people in the real world have used it to bring about or support uh, their implementation plans. Um, we know that because they sometimes contact us to ask us questions about the phases and, and suggestions for doing things. 
they often don't publish because they're not implementing for the purpose of research or for publication. So they just do it. We also know that uh, the model has been used to guide um, research on implementation and research proposals um, have been have used the framework to say, these are the phases and this is what we're doing in our research um, proposal that addresses you know, what phase. Um, we know that it's been used by lots of trainees in, in thesis work and we, uh, I get every month someone who wants uh, permission to use the figure of the knowledge to action model in their uh, thesis or doctoral work. Um, and we've been told when I've given talks, people have come up afterwards to tell me that they've used it um, to explain the implementation process to managers and supervisors to help them appreciate the, the breadth and what needs to be um, done. And um, we've had a student who's also used it. So he was interested in change agents and champions and looking at what the literature said were the roles of champions and facilitators and mapping it back to the knowledge to action uh, cycle to show how much of what people in these categories, knowledge brokers actually do a lot um, with the different phases of the knowledge to action cycle. Okay, great. Um, so it seems like you're saying that uh, thing is not working, there it is, that the um, knowledge to, to action cycle is derived from an analysis of a whole variety of other frameworks and is kind of like a, a meta description of the essential elements of turning knowledge into action. And the other thing I heard you say was that its use has been very flexible, even though most of the writing has been about its use in health sciences. It's been used at all different levels of an organization um, for many different purposes, including explaining what uh, the implementation process entails, as well as guiding the activities itself, if I've got that correctly. You have, and, it, and it's been widely cited, which doesn't mean that it's not necessarily been used, but um, in the journal um, of continuing professional education. Um, it's the most cited paper that that journal has. And I think it's been cited over 4,000 times. And in another analysis that we didn't do, um, it was reported to be the most frequently cited knowledge translation framework in, in contemporary times. So a lot of people are certainly engaging with it. Um, and we have, Jenny Moore has done a study in um, rehab that just looked at rehab studies. I think there were 49 of them and then did an analysis to see how did they actually use uh, the framework. And it was the same thing. Sometimes it's to implement. And so it's the guide to implementation. Other times it's the guide to studying implementation. Um, but that's kind of the, the context. Okay. So now that we have um, kind of the buildup to this much cited and often used framework, could you perhaps give us what the key components of the knowledge to action framework actually is? Yeah, and as they say, a picture's worth um, a thousand words and I need to bring up these slides. There we go. And if I can do this, uh, Okay, sorry about this, should have been at the front. Uh, can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so from those 30 uh, planned action models, these are the seven phases. And in, in our work, you won't see it referred to as steps. We had, the team had great discussions about whether we should call them steps. And we ended up not doing that because we didn't want people to think it was like a staircase or a pathway where you do one step and then you have that leads to the next one because many of these things may happen at the same time. So sustaining knowledge use um, and you start at the bottom um, is the last phase 
here, but in fact, you need to address sustainability at every uh, phase of the process. So we call them phases. And when you boil down those uh, 30 planned action uh, models and frameworks, this is what you come up with. So if we start at the bottom, the essential is, so what we found with some of them, they started with, we have a problem. What are we going to do about the problem? How are we going to address the problem? And some of those uh, frameworks and models actually started with, we have a solution. There's knowledge out there that something works usually. Um, and so do we need to implement that? Are we doing okay? Or do we need to implement it? And so we thought that it, since you could start either with a problem or with a solution, what was really key was you need to determine the no do gap or the evidence practice gap. So what would be ideal practice or policy and what is currently happening? And then as a group, we would need to decide, do we need to take action and reduce that gap? Because we want to be more in line with whatever the best, I'll call it best practice uh, happens to be, or the best policy. So that's the initiation of, of the first phase. Do we need to do anything or are things fine the way they are? If the decision is we actually have a no do gap and the no do gap comes from the WHO, the World Health Organization, and it's knowing from the literature and what we do. And so are, are we being guided by um, whatever the best information is that's out there? Then the next phase is, well, you need to adapt that knowledge. So in my context, most of my work, all of my work is, is clinical. So it probably would be a practice guideline, for example, or it could be the results from a systematic review or another study. And so the issue would be, so if the recommendations are to do something, do we need to adapt it to our context? Is it fine the way it is? Or in fact, our health care system is a little bit different, maybe from the US system. And so those rec US recommendations are a pretty good fit, but we need to change things. And it might be little things like we change the, you know, the, the formatting of the document, um, or we change it to UK English from US English. Um, or we translate it into French, so simple kinds of things. Or it could be, for example, someone is to do an assess. I'll, I'll give you the clinical example. So the recommendation is a nurse should do a certain assessment when patients are admitted. The unit looks at this and says, yes, we agree that there's good evidence to do this, but on admission, patients have four hours of assessment. We can't add another half hour. So do we move it to the second day or do we find someone else? Maybe the social worker could do that assessment on the first day to free up the nurse's time for what they have to do. So that would, so they're trying to keep the spirit of the recommendations, the knowledge that needs to be implemented, uh, but they're adapting it to the, the context. So now that we know exactly what needs to be implemented, we need to find out are there barriers or facilitators to the uptake. And so they could be related to the people the, who, who are doing the adoption of the innovation. They could be related to the context or, or the environment that, you know, if you're not paid to do something, you're less likely to do it and that's going to be a problem. So what would be those barriers? They don't know how to do it. So how are we going to deal with that? And the reason for the barrier assessment then allows you to say, well, how can we pick implementation interventions to overcome those barriers? So if the issue is people don't know how to do the thing, then maybe education would be a good way to approach that. Um, maybe people forget to do the thing. Well, education's not going to fix that. Maybe we need a reminder system. Uh, maybe people don't think it's a good thing to do. It's an attitude problem, well, issue. Maybe we need to come up with some education and maybe we need to use opinion leaders to convince them that this is the right thing to do. So that assessment of the barriers and facilitators allows you to better pick strategies to overcome them. And then um, knowledge use and evaluate the outcomes. The distinction there is with monitoring the knowledge use. So the no like whatever the knowledge is that we're wanting to put into practice, um, or into policy, is there adherence? Is it actually happening? Are people doing the thing that you want them to do? 
which is different from if they do it, what's the impact or the outcomes? And the importance there of actually thinking about both, you don't necessarily need to measure both, but you have to think about both, is if you implement and you don't measure if people are actually changing their practice, but you're looking at outcomes that's supposed to reduce costs, for example, and there's no change in costs, is it because the thing actually doesn't work or is it because people aren't using it? And so that's why you need to know, is there uptake? And then if there's uptake, because you may have good uptake, but you don't get the outcome for all sorts of reasons. And then although it's in last place, uh, sustaining knowledge use, then this is because it's a two dimensional drawing and we didn't, we, we, could, we weren't smart enough to figure out a better way of where to place it. Um, all of the, so it's important to think about how are you gonna sustain the uptake of the innovation uh, beyond your implementation period, but you need to be building sustainability in, into all of the earlier steps as well. So that's the action part of the cycle. And of course, you'll recall that it's the knowledge to action cycle. So that's the, the action piece. So many of those 30 models didn't actually talk about what's the knowledge. And, and you'll recall that, or you won't recall, um, we deliberately called it the knowledge to action and not research to action because there's all sorts of ways of knowing. And so for us, it was more about the knowledge and it might come from em empirical studies, but it could be coming from experience, for example, it could come from legal knowledge, it could come from philosophical knowledge. So that's why it's knowledge as opposed to um, evidence to action or research to action. So to give more flexibility. So the notion of where is the knowledge that we're hoping can be implemented, where does it come from? And so um, we kind of thought of it as this funnel where you've got first generation knowledge. So studies or wherever the information's coming from. And so the challenge there is you may have hundreds of sources of information or hundreds of studies and you can't do much with that because it's just too overwhelming. So you actually want to do knowledge synthesis where you then are kind of aggregating what we know from the literature usually. Um, and so we refer to that as second generation uh, knowledge, and that's a little bit better or easier to implement because you now have a handle like overall, what do we know about this innovation? Um, but what people really want are knowledge products and tools. So, so um, boiling down the synthesis into things that would actually be helpful in decision making. And so it could be algorithms or guidelines um, or decision aids or checklists or whatever, but things that people who are making decisions about the, this knowledge and when to implement it um, can easily. And so in those knowledge products and tools, often you don't have pages and pages and pages of the synthesized information. You just have, think about this and think about this and think about you know, whatever the third thing is. So when you put the two together, you actually get the knowledge to action um, cycle. And so I'll draw your attention to these little arrows here. And this is an older version without a graphic designer. So it's exactly the same thing. Um, but at each of these phases, there may be uh, primary studies or knowledge that you would want to draw on. There may be synthesis out there, knowledge synthesis in the literature that you might want to draw on to help with any one of these phases. And there may be uh, products and knowledge products and tools that would help you with any one of these phases. And it could be that they're out there and you, you just go to the literature and you find them. Or in our case, we've often had to develop them because implementation is all about the local context. And so the group might say, oh, we need this kind of a tool would be really helpful. And so can you help us build that kind of tool? Uh, in healthcare, it's often around the um, documentation system. So changing the charting, the forms uh, to incorporate things that require people to fill in information that allows them to then think about things a little bit differently. Anyway, uh, that goes around to remind us that at each of those phases, there may be 
primary information synthesis or products and tools that you can bring into this process or that you may need to develop to bring into this process. So something else while we're here is, and someone had a question about this, um, which was related to uh, the engagement of clients and other people in the process. And I just want to go back for a minute to say, when we think about this, the way I use the, the framework is very much an engaged kind of approach. And in each one of these phases, clients, in my perspective, clients should be there. Uh, providers should be there. Managers maybe should be there. And it really depends on what the goal is at each of those phases. But thinking of it very much as a team sport and how do you bring in all of the other perspectives becomes really important. And so, okay, there we go. So there's three main ways that people have used the, the framework. And so we've labeled this the push. So it's typically this fellow represents researchers and they come up with the knowledge products and tools or the synthesis and they push it to the people in the, in the real world who are the ones who would actually do the action cycle. And so it's two worlds, the researchers and then the people who would use uh, the results of researchers, uh, the, of the research. And often they don't work anywhere near this hard, right? The push is essentially they publish it and that's the end of that. But it's, no, okay, I, I, I'm nearly done this set of slides. Um, and then there's pull. And so here, this is where people in, the real world decide what they need and they go out and find it. So they don't need to interact with researchers or anybody else, they will find. And so they pull it in and they take care of themselves. And then this is the model, we call it integrated knowledge translation, but it's co-creation, it's engagement. And it's really the notion of, well, we need to be implementing as a team, which may or may not include researchers, but needs to include all of the relevant stakeholders uh, in the group that you're trying to influence. Oh, you said a lot, Ian, and it's uh, it's a lot to take in, but it sounds very rich and complex um, in its perspectives, which I really like because we know that the process of helping people to decide to take information on board and then to incorporate it into their daily practice is very complex and involves many different levels of stakeholders at different points in time. So thank you for creating a, an easy to grok, if I can say that word, um, graphic to incorporate all of that. And I, um, you've said before that the uh, this framework or this cycle has been used in health sciences. Can you give any examples of the use of this cycle in a disability ar arena, employment, or otherwise? Yes, I can. And so very busy, busy slide. I want to thank Jim Reamer uh, uh, for the slide. And so you'll see on the left-hand side um, the knowledge to action cycle. And so what you see on the right hand side is actually a project and I was part of uh, Jim's project and he is brilliant with coming up with acronyms. And so you'll see that um, the picture on the right is actually NCATS, which stands for Knowledge Adaptation Translation and Scaling Up. And the N is for NICPADS which is the National Center on Health, uh, Physical Activity and Disability. And so I think uh, this is also funded by Neidler. Um, and so if we kind of look at the strategy one here, um, you can see the, the knowledge creation funnel. And so with this project, they were taking CDC prevention strategies for obesity and wanting to adapt them. So that's the piece here and come up with what were called grades, which stands for guidelines, recommendations, adaptations, including disability. And there isn't a test on this, so it's okay. Um, and so these grades were essentially recommendations. So I think there was something like 21 CDC recommendations. And then there was an international or a national committee that then took each of one of those and thought about it from a disability perspective to say, how could that recommendation be adapted to be more appropriate 
for people with disabilities. And they had, I think, three different categories of disabilities that they actually focused on. And then iCHIP is the Inclusive Community Health Implementation Package. And, and many of you may be aware of this. So that was kind of the evidence of or the information that needed to be implemented. And then under the evidence practice gap, they actually said, okay, we need to have, we want communities to embrace these, the grades, these recommendations to, to change what they do so, so as to reduce obesity with people who have disabilities. And so how we're gonna do that is these communities need to have a call to action and they need to uh, um, establish an inclusive health coalition and they need to do an assessment to figure out what they need to focus on. So that's the evidence practice gap piece. And they need to draft a plan of how they're gonna proceed. So all of that kind of fell into this first category of identify the problem, what's the solution and what are you gonna do about it? And then they actually have the communities sit down with the list of 23 and prioritize them and pick a couple that they think they can actually uh, deal with and then think about how can they adapt um, those recommendations for their particular community. And then, and so for example, I think one of them was um, people need to have better access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So that's the recommendation. And so the barriers were, well, um, in some inner city areas, in some neighborhoods, um, the grocery stores don't have lots of fruits and vegetables. If they do, they're not good quality and they're very expensive. So that's the barrier. We don't have a supply. So there's, I'll call it step three was, okay, how, what's the strategy to overcome that? And one example was um, connecting with local farmers and having them bring truckloads of food in and create a farmer's market in these neighborhoods that wouldn't, that where the grocery stores don't you know, have the produce that they wanted. So that's how they were gonna get around. Uh, the stores don't want to, to bring in the fruits and vegetables. And so um, then the next step was the community needs to actually think about how are they going to monitor the uptake in this case of, you know, are the farmers bringing the food? Are people able to purchase the food? Uh, what does that process look like, the implementation process? And then evaluating outcomes might be, you know, is the nutrition or food security changed in that neighborhood because of, of this intervention? And then step six being, you know, how are we going to sustain the continued access to fruits and vegetables uh, in this community? So that um, kind of in a nutshell is how Jim and that team actually used the knowledge to action cycle and then built on it to make their own framework Well, as I said, uh, the complexity is really striking. And um, one of the, the, the next question that I have really re is a little tricky. And that is, has to do with this notion of adapting guidelines. I understand that Jim Rimmer took guidelines presented by the CDC and then adapted it to his particular um, population that he was working with in order to be able to synthesize the knowledge that had been garnered in the area of health promotion around obesity in order to apply it specifically to the population of people with disabilities. As you know, the available N in disability, specifically employment research, which is the focus of most of our work, um, disability employment research, that N is not very large in any one disability group. And therefore, typically, the majority of the research that is conducted is quasi-experimental or correlational or qualitative or mixed method designs. And as such, the disability field, again, in general, with some specific um, differences, is not usually guideline driven. And if the findings in the field do not primarily draw from RCTs, nor one in which guidelines are a prominent feature, can we still use the knowledge to action approach? And, um, and I guess that's the second part of that is what does this approach recommend in order to make decisions about what knowledge to synthesize and implement in such circumstances? 
So you mentioned it in passing in, a, in your previous remark, you said there are different ways of knowing and, and certainly in our disability research, we often talk about the difference between best evidence and the best available evidence. Um, and our decisions are usually based on the best available evidence at the time. So I'll leave you some space yep. to answer that very long question. Sorry about that. And it's a really good question um, as well. And so I would agree with you. It's always about the best available evidence. And um, clinically, it's often, if it's issues around effectiveness, it's often based on experimental designs. But in terms of the knowledge to action model, um, I think what we need to think about is, well, what is considered um, best available evidence? And we know that it will and does differ by whomever is wanting to implement an in innovation in a specific context. And so what you might consider uh, best evidence in my context or with my group, they would say, oh, we don't think it's ready for prime time yet. So we know that this happens all of the time. And so there is no requirement with the knowledge to action framework that you have to use you know, randomized control trial evidence. And in fact, as I mentioned, and you noticed in the lost in knowledge translation paper, which is the first paper that we presented the, the KTA in, we acknowledge that um, there's different kinds of knowledge other than empirical evidence derived from trials. So I think what's really uh, key here is to think about what is the, and I'll say evidence, um, for the proposed innovation. And <coughs> presumably no one's going to want to implement something if they don't think it's actually beneficial based on whatever that evidence happens to be or how much of that evidence there is. So I think a group, an implementation group, needs to be asking questions like, um, is the evidence sufficient to justify implementing the, the innovation? Now, a rule of thumb in implementation science is that probably you shouldn't change a practice or a policy based on the results of a single study, but there are always exceptions. Um, and the concern there is that those findings from a single study um, might have just happened by chance, so random error. And so the importance within science of the need for replication so that you're actually sure that the findings are, are what they are. But I wouldn't say don't implement something if it hasn't been replicated either. I think we need to be taking a very sensible kind of approach and thinking through um, what is the available evidence? Can we interrogate it? Let the group decide whether they think there's enough evidence that warrants the implementation. So I would, I would kind of reframe your question to say, implementation groups need to be thinking about what in their minds constitutes judicious implementation. So how big is the need to do something? How beneficial could the innovation be? What might be the opportunity costs? We often think that implementing something um, is always a good thing. Well, it's not necessarily. If there's another innovation that has stronger evidence for it or shows uh, a larger effect size, and we choose option A over option B, well, that means people may be denied something that works better in the B category. So just wanting to be good and implement, we need to be thinking of what are the consequences of um, implementing. Um, what other things? Are there potential harms? Right? So some things are very benign and implementing them really has no risk or harm associated with it. And so your concern about implementing that should be way less than if there's something that has you, you could perceive could adversely affect people. Um, then there's also issues at, the, at a policy level when you think about implementation um, and what the evidence. So if, if there's a study, a correlational study that shows that something's beneficial in the employment context, so we initially think, oh, this would be great. We should implement it. Have we looked at that study really carefully to see did they use a homogeneous group 
of uh, employees or was it a diverse group? So is, do we, are we potentially concerned that if we implemented this innovation, some segments of the workforce may benefit a lot, but others may actually be disadvantaged by it. So I think it's thinking about all of these factors of how whatever it is that you're implementing and evidence is just one of those uh, features that you need to consider because you may have very good evidence that something's beneficial, but it's only beneficial for one group. And so do you want to privilege one group over others? And you might, if the group is a disadvantaged group and you're trying to bring them up to the standard of everybody else. But if you're privileging the group that already has lots of advantages, then you may say, we know that if we did this, that group would do better, but maybe we need to think about not giving them further advantage and looking to a group that isn't doing as well, for example. So I, I think thinking through what's the role of evidence as a group, how important is that to us? What are the, the downsides if we implement or don't implement? Who's going to be affected in what kinds of ways? Are there potential harms um, that we could anticipate? And that may temper our enthusiasm or increase our enthusiasm Great. for implementing. Right, so there are a lot of factors involved in that decision. And sometimes in our field, uh, I mean, we work in psychiatric disability and employment research. Um, there aren't a lot of other interventions to compare the intervention that you're developing. There may be one or two, um, or there may be none. And so the decision to actually invest in implementation sometimes comes from a combination of client preference, what we know about the practitioner baseline expertise, like does it require some really high complex uh, level of staffing, which these days in mental health um, organizations don't happen to be there. And, um, you know, environmental factors. Uh, and essentially, we're asking ourselves the question, what is the advantage of this particular intervention that we've come up with over what is being done now. So sometimes yeah. it's just a matter of what, if you pardon the language, what's being done now sucks. And we've got something that we have some emerging evidence is a little better and it becomes a moral imperative to at least put it Try. out there and to weigh the risk of yeah. putting it out. Yes. So when you talked about the risk factor, I was thinking about um, interventions such as photo voice, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. And we know that photo voice, which is the matter of uh, take, giving people cameras so that they can record their experience and using that experience kind of as a springing or a, a stepping stone to um, planning some action that comes from it. It's an intervention that's preferred by clients. It has low risk if it's implemented, even though there is currently only emerging data on its use in the disability field. So essentially we're trying to say, and you said this yourself, is the investment needed to promote the uptake worth the effort based on what we know, given all of these various factors? Would you agree with that? Absolutely, and, and what you described is what I would hope that the implementation team would think about all of those things and realize that there are trade-offs. And then even if they, like all of the time, we want more evidence, like more evidence we think is, is better in helping us make decisions. But in the real world, we don't always have the evidence that we want and we still have to make decisions. So you need to take into account client preferences, uh, the provider's views on these issues, what it's going to cost, the potential savings it might have, the benefits that it would accrue to the you know, uh, employers and the employees, all of those kinds of things. And on top of, so it, even if we don't have all of the evidence that we would like, go ahead and implement and have a really good evaluation process 
so that you can get your own data to say, you know what, we've done this and these, this is what we found in terms of, we think it's beneficial. This is how it's beneficial to who, whomever. We've captured information on costs. It's fee reasonable and feasible or, or whatever it is. Um, and so collect your own data, right? right. So that's the right. other piece. If, if it's not out there, implement, evaluate, right. And you're, and if you find out that you're not getting the outcomes that you hoped you were getting, then you can make a decision of maybe we shouldn't continue to do this, um, or maybe we need to change what we're doing to try to get better outcomes. Right, right, and and so that feedback loop at the end is really important. And you know, we're often as Nidler grantees in the position where part of our grant is a requirement to do technical assistance training, essentially to do implementation. And in the space of the Nidler grant, we might have four years of research, and then we have the last six months to do something. So sometimes we're doing things because it's mandated to do it. And sometimes we're doing it because, of course, not only is it mandated, but we have other evidence that it might be important to do. But could you clarify what you mean by the implementation team that you've mentioned now a few times? Who, are, uh, who do you imagine that is? So it obviously depends on what exactly is the problem and what the potential solution is. So it's the group of people that um, have volunteered or have been tapped on the shoulder to actually facilitate the implementation of whatever the thing is, I'll call it the thing. Right. Um, and then what becomes imp really important to me is, and when we think of what's the evidence practice gap and do we need to do something about it, is are all of the potential stakeholders at the table? Because the way this can work is employers, the employer may decide this is a problem. Well, if they don't actually talk to employees to get their perspective, they have the power to define what it is. So we need to make sure that these teams are actually diverse and all of the relevant stakeholders are there so that when these decisions are being made about, is this a problem? Well, a problem for whom, right? right? How right. big a problem for whom, right? So when I'm talking about the implementation team, it should be likely employers and employees and maybe, you know, policymakers, um, could be people from other industry, what, like who, whatever the issue is, who are those stakeholders? And I like to think of stakeholders in three kind of categories. I break them down to make it easier to, to figure out how to work with the different groups. So if, and we call the first group knowledge users. So who are the people that would actually be making decisions uh, based on that innovation or that evidence or that knowledge? So they're actually making the decisions. So in this example, it could be the employers are making a decision to implement a new way of doing things. Um, or it could be the employee is being asked to do things in a different way. So that would be a knowledge user. The second category are, these aren't people who are actually using the knowledge, but they're impacted by the decisions, right? So they, that's why they're invested, but they themselves, so um, the employer is making the decision, but it's having a huge impact on the employee. And so they would be affected by the decisions, impacted by the decisions. And then the third category is a little bit more distant. So they're not making the decisions, they're not impacted by the decisions, but they are actually interested in what's happening. So the public, so they may, the, the public aren't the employers, they aren't the employees, but they're actually wanting to know how are people with disabilities or whatever being better integrated, you know, into the labor market. Right, so the decision-making and the stakeholder groups are specific to the kind of decisions that are being made and the level of interest in the particular topic, which I think is really important for us as Nidler grantees to keep in mind, because often when we're thinking stakeholders, we're thinking at a more generic level, you know, who is involved overall in the topic. And I think for implementation, it's really clear that you need different stakeholder groups for different moments in time around different issues if you really want to promote the uptake. 
Um, we have time, excuse me for wrapping this one up. We have time for a couple questions that were sent in in advance. And I'm hoping if we talk fast, we might be able to take one from the floor as well. So one question that was uh, sent to us ahead of time is this, what are critical factors in fostering the application of implementation science in human services? Like how do we get people to actually use what we've learned in implementation science in human services? Yep, uh, very good question. So I would say each of the, all of the phases in the knowledge to action cycle are important for different reasons. So I would, go back to the knowledge to action cycle and look at that. I would say another critical ingredient, uh, uh, ingredient is what we've been talking about. So being inclusive uh, and, and the engagement of all of the different kinds of stakeholders and making sure at the different phases, the right people um, are included um, because we often forget that. And so some people kind of take charge and then they may not always be bringing in all of the different perspectives, which is often needed um, because implementation really is in my mind, a team sport. And so it needs to be inclusive and interdisciplinary and always involve um, clients um, and thinking about who is and who isn't involved in deciding what the problem is. Um, and what the solution might be and what the strategies for implementing might be. Um, we found that we found this a lot that um, physicians may decide the best way to implement something and they've left nurses out and it's actually nurses are the ones that have to do whatever. And so the implementation's a failure because they didn't actually engage the people who had to do the work and they didn't understand how nurses actually work and how they can change things. So that becomes very important. And then one other ingredient, I think it's an ingredient that's really critical, um, is marshalling the local data on context because the external evidence about the solution, you know, like what works can come from the literature, but how you actually get that into your context or your setting, you need data on how well are you doing? What's that evidence practice gap? What's the data on the uptake? What do you know about the barriers of your people, right? Not somebody in the literature, but the people here in this organization, um, collecting the data on is there uptake? Is there impact? How do we know it's being sustained? So really investing in what's our local data that we need to make sure we can implement and sustain and use that, feed it back into the process to say, use it to say we're doing a really good job, use it to say we need resources so we can do better. Um, so yeah. I think those would be, so being inclusive in terms of engagement, using and getting and using the local data um, and then working on, and maybe in your context of employment, it's different, but in my context, we talk a lot about interdisciplinarity, but teams don't actually function really, like they're not good functioning teams. And so we need the teams to function well in order to do implementation well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, Given those critical factors, um, we know that incorporating the stakeholders, as well as, as we mentioned before, client preference, value systems, clinician expertise to make these decisions along the way about innovations is important in uh, creating action. Do you have any tools or resources that you can name or think of um, to help us to incorporate client preferences, value systems uh, in, in this kind of decision-making that we're talking about? Or uh, do we need to make them up ourselves? Um, so th there are tools, and, and this question was a really interesting one for me because in fact, um, it is the definition of evidence-based practice in nursing that you need to consider the evidence from the best available sources. You need to consider patient uh, preferences and values. You need to take into account the clinician's expertise and experience. And the fourth category is the resources. W what can you do? 
uh, under what circumstances. And I think not so much as a tool, but actually thinking about those categories when teams are thinking about implementing and making sure that they're addressing and bringing into it. So in terms of the, the tools, there's ones around shared decision making, which may or may not be relevant. And so I think it's, it's too um, context specific to actually say there is a tool that will always help you get at client preferences, for example. Um, but I think everything in the question is absolutely right. When you're implementing, you do need to take into account value systems and client preferences um, and provider values and preferences. Great. So maybe that's uh, another grant that we can write. The development yeah, that would be great. of tools to measure that. That's the next, the next cycle for Nidler funding. Um, we have time for one more question from the floor. And I see Deborah Wilcox asked a question. I want to just check in with Deb to find out, did, was your question answered? Because I heard sort of parts of it being answered. Um, Marianne, can you hear me OK? I can. Deborah. Okay, great. First of all, I just want to thank um, Dr. Uh, Ian uh, for the presentation. Uh, implementation, as you know, I'm an organizational development consultant, and uh, implementation is certainly, you know, the most critical aspects of moving forward to as we create best practices. So my question is, and this often gets left out of uh, how we need to be focused in the 21st century in terms of whole person wellness, in, in, in particular, looking at in rehab and mental health uh, rehabilitation. And Dr. Ian, here's my question. Have you thought about or have you infused cultural competency? And when I say culture, I mean in multicultural competency within the context of ethnicity, not organizational culture per se. Yeah, yeah. In knowledge generation, acquisition and dissemination in implementation strategy and infuse how do you, and have you had discussions in your research um, analysis? How do you infuse that cu cultural competency and into the organizational operation? As you well know, that culture shapes worldview and culture shapes the different ways knowledge is obtained and generated. Yep. Um, so that's coming. I think the implementation field is a little bit behind and, and cultural competencies is one of the areas, but a, another area that's related where we are making progress, we have six research teams in Canada that are focusing on this. And it's how do you bring in sex and gender and intersectionality into implementation? And so um, we have a bigger challenge as you've alluded to the original research hasn't taken these things into consideration. And so when you're then implementing, you're challenged with, well, how do we know if, you know, different intersectional groups are advantaged or disadvantaged by the evidence? And then we start thinking about, well, what are the implementation pieces? So in 2016, I, I wrote a paper, it was the first one in the implementation literature on the integration of sex and gender, which is a long way from what you're referring to, um, in implementation. And why aren't we considering um, men and women and uh, people of di diverse genders think about things differently, are motivated by different factors. And if we're not actually taking these things into account when we're trying to influence change, we're kind of missing the boat. And, and so your question is a really good one. And I'm sad to say that we, the field hasn't got there yet and hasn't figured out that. And part of it may be bouncing the question back to it's the original, the primary studies need to deal with this first before we can deal with it on an implementation level. And that's not a good enough answer, but. It's another area for future grants. Yeah, Lots absolutely. of grants. Absolutely. Another, another and I shouldn't be giving all this away, but another, Another area for us to develop uh, and that I think Nidler would be very open to. We only have a minute left, so I just want to wrap things up and to remind you, as I said at the beginning, we will be providing coaching services to Nidler grantees who are doing employment research. 
um, guided by this particular cycle uh, in 20, starting in 2023. So look, watch out for notifications about those coaching opportunities that will be coming. Second, I just want to mention that we're going to be sending you a quick evaluation survey to uh, give us your feedback on this presentation in the KT Academy series under sector. Um, and based on your feedback, we might pro provide a, a second follow-up series that would go more into depth about the various components of KTA. So watch for the evaluation survey. It'll only take a couple minutes of your time. It'll be Qualtrics, easy to answer. I'm sure you've done it a million times in other contexts and we appreciate, we appreciate your um, filling that out. And of course, I want to thank Dr. Graham for his presentation and participation and thank you to everyone uh, for your attendance and participation. We look forward to contacting you in the future. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, bye.